Affairs and for Research and Development at the University of Missouri System. That's our four campus system. He's also Senior Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Studies here at the University of Missouri campus here in Columbia. Uh, Dr. Foley is a chemist by training. He received his undergraduate degree from Providence College, his master's from Purdue, and his PhD from Penn State. Uh, before coming here, he's uh, been a, a professor at the University of Delaware and a professor and administrator at Penn State. And before I uh, give him the floor, I want to add one last thing, which is to thank him uh, for the support that his office has given to our new uh, entrepreneurship clinic. Uh, that support is critical to getting us jump started, and I very much appreciate it. Dr. Foley. Dean Myers, thanks very much for having me here today. I'd like to thank Professor Crouch and also Professor Levin. Uh, this is wonderful. I couldn't be more delighted uh, by the fact that we are now going to have a center in entrepreneurial and IP law. I think it's just fantastic. Um, this is about as close as I've ever gotten to being a law professor, and probably closer than I'll ever get again. Uh, I did visit William & Mary a couple of times when my daughter was there as a law student, and I did see Paper Chase. Uh, but that's, that's about it. And, and so I know a little bit about this, though, right? And that is uh, the Socratic method. Uh, and so. What I wanted to ask you is, um, why do you think a vice chancellor for research would even be happy about having a new center like this on campus? Could someone pick that up for me? Uh, yes, sir. Good. Could I have your name after class, please? Uh, you strike me as a student with enormous potential. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I see a lot of potential here. But, but what might I be looking at? What sort of potential might I see? And why might I be excited about that potential? You look like a bright student right there. You, you young fellow. How about you? The guy behind you. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think that's, that's right on target. Now, I realize if I were truly Socratic, I wouldn't affirm that way. I'd just continue to ask questions. But <laughs> I, I only have a few minutes here. And I know I will uh, tax the patience of, of everyone here if I continue on along this tack. But I do want to say how thrilled I am. And yes, we did put resources into this. And we hope to put more resources into it as it continues to grow. I think it's a really terrific investment for the university. Part of our plan is, in fact, to grow our own entrepreneurs here in the Columbia area and around the state, to grow our own entrepreneurial community, people who know how to do this, people who will be serial entrepreneurs. And we've put funding into that as well. So we have our first class of entrepreneurs, scholars, and interns that's just been selected. And they hopefully will perpetuate themselves and create a community if a few of them stay here every year, then in fact, after five or 10 years, we'll have a no kidding community of serial uh, entrepreneurs, which I think is exciting. This can only make that even easier, make it even better. And having the likes of uh, Dennis Crouch and James Levin and some of the other people who are here, uh, who've been uh, brought here to work in this area, I think is exciting. I think it's also tremendously exciting for the law school. I mean, I was thrilled to see the latest uh, rankings of the law school uh, in US News and World Report. And you know, rankings, as we know, particularly with law schools, could be a little dangerous. Business schools, even more so. Uh, that's been in the news recently. That was a little bit of a joke, but no one got it. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but basically, we, we always refer to rankings when we like what they say. And, and I like what this ranking had to say about us, and I hope and working with your new dean and with this center, that we can really begin to put ourselves at the forefront of this field and to be recognized nationally, indeed internationally, in this area. And I think that's a wonderful way for us to climb forward. I'm excited about working with the law school on creating PhD JD programs, MS JD programs, where 
people like uh, Dennis, who I think was an undergraduate engineer, became a JD. I think that's terrific. Where's, where's Lana Nedlick? I think Lana's here somewhere. Lana is a chemical engineer by training with her JD. And uh, who knows, if I keep doing as poorly as I'm doing by, as vice chancellor of research in two years, I may be coming back here for a JD as well. So with all that in mind, I'd just like to say welcome, thank you, and, and carry on with all this great stuff. Take care. And if you decide you want another job title, you did such a good job with Socratic Method, come and see us. Maybe we can uh, give you a job over here in law as well. Uh, I want to introduce one other special guest before we get to our keynote, uh, and that is our new director of the Entrepreneurship Clinic. Uh, he is a graduate of this law school, uh, as well as uh, Notre Dame for his undergraduate education. He's currently a practicing lawyer in Atlanta, Georgia. And prior to that, was in the general counsel's office at Assurance, which is a, a Fortune 300 insurance company. Jim's been involved in many, many aspects of a variety of legal issues in business settings. And I think he'll be the, the perfect director for our uh, brand new entrepreneurship clinic. So I'll ask Jim to come down and uh, share some thoughts with us. Thank you, Dean Myers. The origins of my interest in the entrepreneurship clinic derive from me reading one of Gary's emails to alumni. And I have since sent another email to him after that. Recently, when he introduced me as the director, I sent an email saying, I have now read at least two of your emails to <laughs> alums. And both were particularly relevant. When he first uh, broached the idea to the alumni and to the campus community, as a public announcement through his message, my thoughts were, one, phenomenal, amazing, perfect, and two, great, let's catch up with some of the schools that are already doing it, including my undergrad alma mater. Notre Dame has been doing it for years, uh, and as I started thinking about the different things that uh, the person who might do this job uh, could bring to bear, the description that was put out probably had some, some uh, limitations on what you could really get. And the more and more I thought about it, the more this was a nice fit for me with 22 years of experience in a breadth of, of legal practice areas. I uh, spent the last 10 years of which uh, were dealing with new product innovators, and uh, both in private practice and in-house. And I will tell you, there is nothing more enjoyable than working with innovators. I've done a lot of great things, tried cases, had exciting wins, had big deals done, mergers, you know, all kinds of crazy neat stuff. Nothing better than taking a dreamer and making their dreams come true. It's invigorating and it's something that to be able to share that experience with students while they're students is something that we need to be doing. We need to make sure it's successful. And this is an opportunity well beyond just thinking about, okay, let's have students work on some things. This is an opportunity that goes to the law school expanding well beyond our walls. It gives opportunity for collaboration with alums that are practicing in transactional areas, intellectual property. Uh, it allows us to approach other campus leaders and innovators. It uh, allows us to forge uh, collaborations and synergies with the business school that don't exist. Notre Dame's done that quite a bit. So some of the things I've done immediately, even though I'm not paid yet and won't be starting until April, <laughs> some of the things I've been doing, I've established relationships with my counterpart at Notre Dame who is now a good friend of mine, and she has offered up every bit of assistance she can. Same with the, uh, the DREAM program where I'd love for this to get to within a couple of years, which is Penn Law. University of Pennsylvania. They have a phenomenal program and they put a lot of students through it and it's in collaboration with a lot of campus interests and there are a lot of models out there. So part of our goal is to catch up with some of those programs but also to get ahead of the other programs that haven't you know, set foot and to the, to the point of rankings and other things. There are things that go into rankings that none of us really think about which includes placement of students. And these opportunities are critical to placing students. 
And some of us who have done it, I did a criminal prosecution clinic. I learned so much from doing it. I love doing it. It was exciting. It was real. It had consequences to it. This is the same type of thing. And I look forward to sharing that experience with students. And one thing I will leave you with, because I want to get on with the keynote, one thing I will leave you with is this is a great opportunity for us to uh, enjoy support and interaction with alums and practitioners with expertise and various economic development entities. So please be a part of it. Please share your ideas. I'm an open book. I describe myself as someone with unmolded clay and I now create ceramics. And fortunately, I have both a figurative and literal uh, experience with that. So uh, both in practice and I took ceramics at Notre Dame. We had an art, we had an art requirement. But I'm glad to be here. It's great coming back as an alum and being able to contribute. Even better to be able to use stuff that I consider as easy as breathing, share that with students, and give them an opportunity to go and promote themselves and be a cornerstone for this, this clinic foundation going forward. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim, and the check's in the mail, or at least it will be in April. Uh, appreciate you uh, coming here on your own nickel and, and uh, all the work you've been doing even before you started on this job, and we look forward to working with you in the years to come. Uh, and finally, in, the, in terms of this part of the program, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, who's one of the stars of our faculty, uh, Professor Dennis Crouch, who really needs no introduction. Uh, the the uh, editor of Patent Leo and one of our great faculty members, Dennis. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, you can tell if you're a student here and you just heard Jim Neiman talk, you can tell he's going to be a great professor and that uh, if you take part in this clinic, it's going to be a great opportunity. Uh, if you're somebody who has some new venture, uh, you know that Jim is going to be a great person to work with and you might come forward as we start our clinic this fall. Um, if you're here in the audience and you're an intellectual property or entrepreneurship focused lawyer, um, Jim is also going to need your help because although he is an expert, he's not an expert on every single topic that's going to arise. Uh, and so to the extent you're interested in helping out with this new venture, um, contact Jim, contact me, contact uh, Dean Myers. Uh, and, uh, and we very much want to make this uh, collaborative process both within the university committee community as well as extending out to the state of Missouri uh, and to the extent uh, we go beyond that we're perfectly happy. Um, you know so I, I also want to thank uh, Jim Levin for uh, his organizational uh, abilities here. Professor Levin and I uh, have collaborated on a number of events prior to this uh, and continually rely on his, uh, his insight and, uh, uh, and the fact that I am awful at organizing uh, anything. I also thank uh, Dean Myers for conning me into this uh, keynote address. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, I'm honored to speak here today and, and very happy to be here. Uh, uh, and um, you know, I'm really excited about this new trajectory of the law school. Uh, and, and we have a, a group of something like 12 to 13 faculty members. <laughs> Uh, who are committed and interested in the area of intellectual property and entrepreneurship law. And so I think it's great opportunities for our students uh, moving forward. Uh, and so it's a very good time. You know, I teach technology law, both patent law, internet law, licensing law, courses like that. Uh, although today I'm going to go low tech and actually use our uh, overhead projectors uh, just, for, uh, just for some amount of fun. Uh, you know, the real, uh, the real focus of my talk today is really going to be about, um, uh, about this innovator, right? Some innovator, uh, and, uh, and maybe they have some new idea that they're attempting to grow. Uh, maybe at some point they'll do something like patent it. Uh, but that whole process generally and usually also involves other folks. Typically, it's somebody you might call an entrepreneur. Maybe it's the person with money. That is some kind of, uh, some kind of investor. I think I got this here. Some kind of investor who brings along uh, some cash. Uh, and you notice, actually, these are all ones. Uh, but there's, there's, there's 120 there. Uh, you know, and all of this gets organized together into some kind of structure 
right? It's ordinarily some kind of corporate entity. Uh, and this, let me adjust the perspective here. This corporate entity, uh, right, this, this corporate entity is this new venture that really uh, defines the relationship between the parties and, their, uh, and these valuable resources that they've developed maybe in terms of patent rights or other types of contract rights as well. That's really the focus here and in many ways that's the focus of our, uh, of our new center. Before really going there though, um, uh, right, I want to talk about uh, right, a little bit about just our patent system in general and where it came from uh, and perhaps where it's going uh, and then we'll come back. You know, so uh, Dean Myers in his talk talked a little, bit, a little bit about the US Constitution. When he teaches copyright law, he talks about what's called the copyright clause. Uh, and when I teach patent law, I have the same clause, but I call it the patent clause. Uh, right, there's, uh, but, but what this clause says in the United States Constitution here is that Congress has this power Congress has the power to promote the progress uh, of the useful arts uh, by giving inventors what we call exclusive rights, uh, although for limited times. Uh, this, you know, there's a few interesting aspects of, this, um, uh, of these exclusive rights. Uh, one of them is, is that this is uh, the only place in the Constitution uh, where, where we're really giving Congress power and we're explaining why they're giving power. Uh, we're giving power, we're giving exclusive rights for a purpose that is to promote the progress in what, in what in 1788 they called the useful arts. Here I've got some carrots, right? Really these are, right, this is thought of as a carrot, an incentive system. Uh, now my kids said I should use candy because nobody really cares about carrots anymore. Uh, <laughs> right, right, this is, right, these exclusive rights are, are intended to be an incentive. So that, so that someone who is innovative, someone who is thinking about being innovative, will recognize that, hey, if I'm innovative, I can capture some rights, and hopefully I can profit from that. Um, now, kind of in the, uh, uh, in thinking about this, in thinking about this, uh, my, uh, my sense very much is that uh, these patent rights uh, are what you would call a tool, right? These are a tool set up by our constitutional, right, by our founding fathers. Uh, and it's very different than, uh, than what I think of or, or maybe the personal rights that are inherent to the common law, like the right not to be assaulted or the right not to be raped. Those are very much personal rights uh, or, or the inalienable rights that we see in our Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, those are less about tools and more about ways that we want our society to be structured. But the, the patent system is very much a tool. That is, we want to promote the progress. Uh, now, in kind of the background of all of this, uh, we've got this guy who's, uh, whose name is Adam Smith. Adam Smith uh, wrote his most famous treatise uh, published in 1776, very much a contemporary to the founding of this nation, right? And, and, and Adam Smith wrote about the free market, how there's free competition, and that's very much the background. That's very much the background to our competitive marketplace, and really, uh, as uh, today, the marketplace around the world is very much a competitive system. The founding fathers really saw patent rights as an exception to that. Uh, an exception uh, because it serves it as a useful tool to promote the progress. Uh, now, I've got an interesting chart here, and if you, if you ever read my work, you know that I love making graphs. This is just a simple chart, uh, and, and I put it here to show that the scale, right, the scale of things have changed since back in 1788. 1790, we had our first Patent Act. 1793, we had really the first Comprehensive Patent Act. Um, back then, we had very few patents, under 100 per year. Uh, in the year 2014, we had more than 300,000 patents issued in the U.S. Uh, around the world, we have many patent systems. Uh, in the U.S. alone, if you look at patents in force today, we've got more than 3 million. And so we have had a transformation in terms of the scale of our system. Uh, although if you look, at, look back at this 1793 Patent Act, it's actually remarkably similar to the patent law today. That is, even back in 1793, well over 200 years ago, to get a patent, you had to have a new invention, and that invention had to be useful. Those are the same requirements we have today. 
you also, to get a patent, had to submit to the patent office or the regulatory body at the time an enabling disclosure. That is, you had to be willing to publicly share information about your invention so that other inventors could understand how you did this, they could, so that someone could make and use your invention. Uh, back at that time, we also had an examination process. That is, right, unlike in copyright law, where as soon as you fix your, uh, your idea in tangible form, you hold copyright. In the patent system, it's always been such that when you invent, that inventor has then a right to file a patent application, but you really have no exclusive rights. That constitutionally mandated exclusive right doesn't kick in until after the patent office agrees that you actually have a new, uh, a new and useful invention. Um, now I said, right, things have, uh, uh, things have changed dramatically. Um, but back in, right, back in 1788, our founding fathers were very much concerned with monopoly. Uh, and, and, and the impact of giving monopolies uh, to individual parties, and that, and that in part was one, uh, was one trigger uh, of, of the Revolutionary War. Uh, today, uh, today, there's actually much the same debate, uh, much the same debate going on over patent law. Uh, and right, last week, right, last week even, uh, there were major hearings in Congress. Uh, uh, the Patent Office, which is really a branch of the, uh, branch of the presidency, uh, was pushing towards various changes <clears throat> and, uh, and the various courts, including the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Were, right, all of these bodies have some input on our patent system and all of them are being aggressively lobbied right now to transform our system. Uh, and, and the basic policy argument uh, is a question of whether our patent system offers a net benefit. Is it serving its role as a tool? Right? And, and really kind of as a policymaker, people think of the question, uh, is our patent system uh, leaving the world better off? Or right, maybe is it leaving our country better off than would the next best alternative? Uh, and, right, and, and that question is up for debate, certainly amongst academics. Just last week we had two letters to Congress, one of them from half of the patent law academics uh, saying, we got to change the system. It is causing trouble. The other half right, sent a, an almost identical letter uh, except for changing all the knots removing all the knots and then adding them in in the other sentences, right? And so we've got these two debates. Now, uh, just to let you know, I didn't sign either letter, and I don't think Gary did, or Professor Litson, who will be talking later. Uh, and so we're somewhere, right, we're somewhere uh, in, in the middle. Uh, but, right, but it very much is this, uh, is this balance, right? It's the balance, and how are we gonna, uh, how are we gonna figure out Right? How are we going to figure out uh, one way or the other? Uh, to talk, right? Just to talk about this balance, I'm going to flip back to my, uh, uh, I'm going to flip back to my innovator, uh, flip back to their idea, um, and and first let's talk about the benefits of the patent system. Let's talk about the benefits here, uh, and the basic way we can think about this is these exclusive rights, um, these exclusive rights, these carrots, uh, encourage some amount of uh, innovation, in, in, excuse me, where's my money? Here's my money, right? Encourage some amount of investment into this patent system, right? Encourage some amount of investment into research and development. Um, the fact that you have to get a patent first, though, to protect it means that we're also encouraging uh, disclosure of those innovations, right? So we're encouraging investment and we're encouraging disclosure. How does that help our society? Well, it's really, right, it's really two simple ways. One is that we get these new products. We get new products on the market that hopefully improve lives. Uh, and certainly patents have the power to, right, that new innovations have the power to dramatically improve lives uh, in the areas of medicine. Uh, we've got folks even on this campus working on uh, clean energy technology. Uh, we've got huge advances that have taken place in communications and other fields, transportation for, in for instance, all of these areas. Uh, the fact is if patents encourage innovation there, then that can be a huge positive benefit. Um, now, even if somebody doesn't end up creating a product that gets to consumers, uh, another, another major element that happens is that, is that patents end up serving as this building block. 
Uh, that is, when I have some innovation uh, and I disclose it to the public, uh, future innovators can build upon that and take the next steps. Uh, and, right, and, 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 and we've got, we think of this in terms of, uh, uh, I think it was Newton who, who talked about how he, right, if he has done anything, it's because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and right in that same approach, and it very much, it's, it's very clear that it occurs. Uh, the only reason why we have an app marketplace is because we had new technology in the smartphone industry. Uh, and, right, and we get these new platforms that encourage new innovation, that then encourage a follow-on new platform, right? And this, and this, cycle, uh, this cycle continues. Um, all of that, right, all of that appears, uh, appears important and beneficial. Of course, right, we've got these half of academics uh, and many, many companies telling Congress, telling the Supreme Court, telling the Patent Office, uh, we've got problems in the system. Uh, and, right, and, and so I thought we'd talk a little bit about those problems here. Uh, now, uh, now the, first, uh, the first kind of cost of the patent system, the first big cost of the patent system is really just the direct cost. That is, uh, hiring any of us patent attorneys uh, is incredibly expensive. And then there's patent office fees, uh, and, then there's, uh, and then there's what you would call litigation costs, right? The cost of enforcement. All of those add up to tens of billions, at least over $10 billion per year in this country in terms of paying attorneys, paying the patent office, uh, and, and paying for uh, related expenses. That's a lot of money. Now, one benefit for the public is that none of that is tax dollars. Uh, and so instead, that money is all paid for through user fees, or if someone wants to hire an attorney, they pay from their own pocket for that attorney. Uh, and so that makes it more palatable uh, for a policymaker's perspective. That is, you can choose to participate or not in many ways. Um, but it's still money that is spent on lawyers and spent on transaction costs, spent on filing fees to the US Patent Office, that might be better spent that you can't, those, money, those companies don't have the money to spend on new innovations, right? Or to spend on other avenues. Uh, and, and so in many ways, it's, it's a big net loss. The second, uh, right, the, the, um, the, the second kind of big cost that, um, that I typically see is, um, uh, is something called monopoly pricing. Uh, and, right, and so for those of you who, who went to business school or, or econ, uh, if you take Econ 101, you've seen this graph and, uh, right, where, where an economist says there's something called a dead weight triangle. That is when one entity is able to raise the price of a good above its marginal cost, um, then there's, a, right, there's less that's going to be bought. Uh, and, and so consumers who would otherwise be able to benefit from this won't be able to. And, right, and so we see this very much in the drug industry uh, where, where the cost to making lots of drugs, uh, lots of, lots of um, uh, prescription drugs are, uh, right, it's very cheap to actually uh, stamp out a drug uh, and, right, and it may only cost uh, two or three uh, dollars or, or even just a few pennies, but then you go to the pharmacy and the cost is uh, the cost is 10 or 20 times that, uh, and, and, and what happens then is folks who might want to buy it won't be able to. We exclude for folks from the market, we limit the, uh, limit the consumption, and we call this kind of the dead weight lost. Um, and it's, right, it's, it's certainly not born in terms of uh, the federal government level. They're still receiving essentially the same tax revenue, uh, but, the, but it's born on the back of consumers. Uh, and so, right, so that those increased costs are, are a genuine and real, uh, and, and real problem. For the patent system, I tend to put less impact on this, uh, just because the way we're talking about the patent system is that we're dealing only with new innovations. Uh, and so it's, it's not as if this is an ongoing monopoly that lasts forever. It lasts for limited times, although it's 20 years, right, a 20 year timeline, um, which to me, when I started in this industry, seemed like a long time. Uh, but just thinking back last night, uh, what was I doing in 1995? I was already, right, I, 1995, uh, I was in the midst of coding JavaScript on the internet, right? All of that, all of that existed uh, 20 years ago. And so, right, so now, where I am in my life now, 20 years doesn't seem like, uh, doesn't seem like that much time. And we're also only dealing with new products, right? So these are new innovations coming to the market, uh, and, and, which is different than if we're raising prices on things that are, uh, things that are already out there. The kind of, the, the third 
cost. The third cost is really kind of the big one uh, that folks are concerned about with the patent system these days. Uh, and, and that third cost is uh, something, right, you might call, you might call the chilling effect. Right, the chilling effect of the patent system. Uh, what, right, what's, what's the problem here? Uh, uh, right, to, to kind of uh, recognize the chilling effect, let's go back to our innovator uh, and, the, and their corporate business. Uh, and, um, and, and I've got some, I've got some nickels here um, that, right, we talked originally that this innovator has a great new idea. They want to get a patent on it. Maybe they already got a patent on it. And they're thinking about releasing this on the marketplace. Um, well, it turns out that just because you have a patent doesn't mean you can actually make or use this. That is, others might have a competing patent. If you look at, it, if you look at a device like a smartphone, the, the estimates are there's, there's one to 200,000 patents um, that, uh, that are infringed by selling a smartphone. Now, some of those are held by the particular company. Some of them are cross-licensed, but many of them are not. Uh, and right, if you're thinking about releasing a new product, well, I'm going to use these nickels to represent patents owned by third parties, right? And there, there's, there's lots of these that, that are potentially in your sphere. Um, and, uh, and those people that own the, right, the folks that own those patents also have a con constitutionally mandated exclusive right. Uh, and so they have the right to exclude our innovator from bringing this product to market. Uh, and if, right, if our money guy knows this up front, then he may as well take some money uh, and invest it in a different venture, right? If this one's not going to work. Now, a pernicious element of all of this uh, is, is that in our current state of the patent system, uh, a substantial number of these patents are actually invalid. Um, that is, they, uh, the patent office agreed to, pa to issue them um, but upon closer examination, they would be found to be obvious and therefore not sufficiently new. Uh, they may find them to be lacking sufficient definiteness. That is, some amount of ambiguity is put into them uh, to, um, right? Uh, and if that's true, they're not valid. Um, the problem for our new venture uh, in, in that front is that, uh, is that in our current state, uh, to uh, uh, to invalidate one of those patents, it's typically at least a hundred thousand dollar venture. Um, much more often, it's a million dollar venture, uh, and that what that would what that would do would take one of the patents off. Um, and um, if you remember my chart, um, if you remember my chart, we've got three million patents sitting out there, and so right, and so. Uh, so, in many ways, new, new innovators, certainly in some market areas, are really seeing the system like this, right? They're, right, they're covered with, uh, right, they're covered with patents, and that's, right, that's, that's the argument, right? That's the argument that these 50, uh, that these 50, uh, that the half, of, half of the law professors are arguing to say, uh, to say, look, um, this process of, of, Bringing something to market is just getting too difficult because of the patent system. Um, now, balancing these costs are difficult, right? Balancing these costs are difficult, uh, and uh, right. And, and one real hope of us forming a center here, uh, kind of a long-term hope, uh, is that we'll be right. The members of the center are going to be pushing towards making this a more rational system. Uh, and certainly, I don't believe, and, and most folks don't believe, the answer is to eliminate the patent system. Um, but, uh, but there are certainly changes that can be made. And so, so next week, I'll be in uh, DC at the patent office working with, uh, with our new patent office director, Michelle Lee, uh, focusing on, can we change patent quality uh, so, that, right, so that maybe we have fewer patents and we can know, we can be better assured that the ones that are there are valid. Uh, and hopefully that'll, right, hopefully that'll push forward uh, a better market for patents go in, in the future as well. Um, following that, I'm headed uh, right, immediately across the coast to a, to a conference at Stanford where I'm proposing another, right, another, uh, another approach uh, to, uh, uh, 
to basically have a check on these patents, basically check to make sure they're of the proper scope, but in a way that is low cost, straightforward, uh, and, and kind of low risk. And, and so both, right, both of those are proposals. Those are long-term proposals. Our short-term proposals uh, are, are, are that we're, right, that's why we're starting this clinic in part. Uh, that's why Jim Neiman is here, uh, is, right, is that uh, it's not just patents, but it's the whole regulatory sphere um, of starting a new venture. There's a lot of roadblocks, right? And so we're hoping that we can be part of that uh, for, uh, for those of you here. I'm going to try to remove these and get back to our, uh, get back to our innovator. Um, uh, so, right, all of these coins here, right, those are, these are all... Um, these are all kind of third party, uh, right? Those are all third party held patents. Let's, let's talk again about our innovator uh, and our patents and how, how this might work. Now, uh, the first step for somebody who is an innovator coming up with a new idea, thinking about whether to patent it or not, what's, what's kind of the benefit there? And I think, that, I think the real first, the real first and big benefit uh, uh, of patents uh, ends up happening when you're talking with, uh, right, you're talking with investors or entrepreneurs who are going to help you with this system. Now, the usual rule with, uh, with kind of a corporate owner um, is, that, is that the owner owns, right, the owner um, has property rights uh, and an employee, right, an employee doesn't really have property rights in their work. Um, and uh, the benefit of patent system is uh, kind of the first benefit is that it helps to change that hierarchy. Um, so, that, right, so that this innovator um, is able to describe and cabinet and put onto paper um, their property rights in the innovation. And, and so uh, when it comes to discussions with, uh, with uh, collaborative entrepreneurs or investors, instead of the hierarchy being like this, we, we come back closer, right, we come back closer to level. Uh, and, and at that point, we recognize that both parties, for there to be a successful collaboration, the parties have to work together. Uh, and it's not that one party can take what the other party's created and run with it. Um, and, and it's not that this individual is simply an employee, but instead they have property rights they have something of value, a valuable resource that they're putting into this venture. Um, and, and, and brings this, right, brings this uh, uh, setup, uh, right, takes this hierarchy, uh, hierarchy to, a new, uh, to, to a new place. Um, you know, so as the business begins, as the business begins, uh, these patent rights are regularly used as collateral uh, for bank loans. Uh, and there's some evidence now that, uh, at least for new ventures, uh, something like half of patents are used, ha right, half of companies use their patents as collateral for the bank loans. Uh, if the business ends up going bankrupt, uh, well, the, uh, right, the patents are very often kind of the only value left. And so, right, and so creditors uh, clamor after those patent rights. And so in that sense, it's a, it's a sort of insurance uh, for the owners or the creditors of this business. Um, patent rights, patent rights, uh, fit into all of those realms. Um, of course, once you, uh, once you get into this business, once you get into this business, uh, one problem is, as I suggested, you're going to face the risk of lawsuits. Um, now, the good news is that, that most third-party patent holders um, wait, uh, and they wait until this company is running. This company either has plenty of money uh, either through investors or because they have a successful product that's on the market. Um, the big exception to that is that, uh, is that uh, you also suffer a great risk of, of a lawsuit uh, if, your, uh, if your new innovation uh, challenges, here I go, challenges what I call the old guard. Um, right, the, 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 so, the, so, um, this guy. So right, if if you right, if you're gonna if your if your business proposition only works because you're taking business away from a market leader, uh, then you also face the risk uh, uh, of patent infringement. Now that right now, uh, so so in many ways, uh, right, in many ways, th and this may be a little comfort, um, but in many ways, getting socked with a patent infringement suit for a new venture 
uh, is, is a big sign of success. It means either, right, it means either you've got, either you're making money uh, or you're destabilizing the marketplace. Uh, and, right, and so, um, uh, right, uh, good or bad, that, right, that's, um, uh, that's where it is. Um, now, when we're talking about our company versus the old guard here, uh, and right, he's the only NBA player older than I am, uh, and so, right, Steve Nash here. And so, right, so we've got um, um, what patents can do um, uh, is also shift the hierarchy between a new venture and the old guard. Now, this is really most successful, right, and most appropriate when the new venture also has a product um, that's a good product that is either starting to sell or is clearly going to be uh, 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 an important role in the marketplace. Uh, and, right, and if you've got that combination of a good product and patent rights or intellectual property rights protecting uh, the, those interests, uh, then, right, then, then we very much see this um, right, hierarchy shifting so that these companies can talk on the same plane. So that they both have, right, that, uh, right, it, it changes the level of competition because of that constitutionally mandated exclusive right. Uh, now, for my part, I see this as, as extremely important uh, just because I've seen in my own practice prior to joining here and, and in reading study after study uh, that our most innovative work, uh, right, is happening with new ventures, right? That new, right, that's where the most radical and kind of game-changing new ideas are happening, uh, less, uh, right, certainly well-established older companies are making innovations. Um, but their innovations tend to be incremental advances on what they've already done. Whereas the new ventures start off in a radically di different direction. Uh, and, and I think that's very much potentially beneficial, uh, right, beneficial to our, uh, uh, to our society. Um, now universities, right, that's kind of the topic today, universities. Uh, universities have a very particular, um, uh, have, have a very particular approach. Uh, in that um, universities hold lots of patents, but it's very rare that a university is actually what you would call a practicing entity. That is, uh, that is we rarely start manufacturing the things that we, uh, we invent here at the university. Um, and, and also universities, public universities like University of Missouri, uh, have an 11th Amendment right to uh, immu sovereign immunity uh, against federal lawsuits. Uh, and so both of those coming together uh, means that for a university, kind of that downside and chilling effect of the patent system doesn't really exist uh, because they're unlikely to get sued and even if they are, they can likely claim sovereign immunity. Uh, and, so, right, and so universities have very strongly, including the Uni University of Missouri, taken a side in this in this debate in patent reform. And so in addition to these kind of academics letters, uh, we also, right, also last week we had uh, a set of 145 universities, which is a large, uh, large number. Almost all of the AAU universities uh, sent this letter to Congress saying, uh, don't uh, change patent law in a way that would hurt us. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, right, and, and uh, right, that type of lobbying sometimes falls on deaf ears, but, uh, but uh, public universities in particular over the past two decades have actually been very successful with that type of lobbying strategy. Uh, and, so, right, and so even in the most recent patent reform bill, there are a number of special provisions that give universities particular rights um, held, by no, held by no one else. Uh, and, um, and, right, and so this may be, uh, so even if we have a change in law, it may be that university innovations uh, will be given kind of a higher status in the law. Maybe it'll be harder to challenge them in the future, uh, or, or, or less likely that um, uh, l less likely that um, a court would invalidate them. Um, so part of our work here, right? Part of our work here at the law school and our new uh, uh, our new center for center. What are we calling it? Center for Intellectual Property and Entrepreneurship. Right, CIPE um, is really towards improving the system. Part of it is towards working with our students, working with all of you uh, in developing all of this. Um, certainly, it's a complicated game, uh, but but we want to be there 
uh, to help. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, and I'm happy to take questions or, um, and, uh, wouldn't, or not? Yes, Ms. Forster. Yeah, and so right. So, um, so the question is, how is our new center going to work with a small business development center? And and in fact, there's a, there's a host of, uh, uh, of of folks who are working on new ventures, entrepreneurship, uh, in this community already. Uh, and uh, right, and, and so there's one one answer is that um, uh, is that we we are waiting a little bit on establishing the particulars of our uh, uh, of how our um, clinic will work because Jim is starting next month and we didn't want to fully define his role we wanted to right we wanted him to help uh, in defining that in particular um, but if we take a step from back from that and I think Jim will agree with this that our our overarching hope is to uh, is to work closely with those organizations that are already doing this work, and we've already reached out to many of them to talk about ways we can collaborate. Uh, and right, and the and the basic notion is that many of these other organizations have uh, have uh, strong skills on the entrepreneurship on the entrepreneurship side, um, but they have fewer skills uh, on the legal side. Uh, and, right, and so, right, and so uh, everyone we've talked to believes that we're going to be able to add significant value uh, and that our students can have an important role to play that's, that's going to be different than what a business student or an engineering student or, or, or health science student might play. Um, but right, and the hope is that there can be a collaborative process. Does that, Jim, are you agree with that? I'm going to be learning a lot the first couple of months. If you have uh, ideas to share, I welcome them and I appreciate them. You know, and, and part of, uh, with our centers here at the law school, one thing that we try not to do is displace um, the work being done by local attorneys. Um, and so, right, and so, uh, right, and so, uh, uh, so, Part of that is working with local attorneys to figure this out, right? And we, so we very much, the one thing about new ventures is that at the early startup stage, they tend not to have money to pay for lawyers at all. Uh, and, right? and, and so, so one thing that Jim's gonna establish is kind of this process of who do we take in as clients so that, so that, it, that right, somehow folks that, that, um, that fit within our model that's not taking away uh, clients from, from folks in, in practice, but is serving a new need. Uh, and, and then what's the process, what's gonna be our handoff process, right? If it turns out to be a successful venture, and let's say they are able to get uh, substantial financing that then would facilitate uh, hiring, uh, right, hiring an attorney outside counsel, right? What, at what point do they cross that threshold where we say, uh, sorry, no more, uh, no more legal services from us, you've gotta to go to the force law firm. Um, okay. And Dennis, to your point about working with the local attorneys, reassure everybody that nothing's been structured in terms of, well, we're targeting this, we're targeting that. First step is we're going to reach out and we're going to interact with local and even regional and uh, statewide attorneys and see, see what's out there, what relationship they would like to have with the uh, center. There are a lot of attorneys who already reached out to us and said, we're entirely supportive of it. Uh, we would like to be a part of it. And my goal isn't to supplant and take away business. My, my goal, ideally, in my infancy of knowing this, is to establish some, fill some needs, as Dennis indicated, especially with ideas that aren't ever going to get acted upon because people can't afford to move on, and generate these things. And then local attorneys should be ready there, you know, have a relationship with the clinic and be ready to take it over. It should be a win-win, but I really want to get out there and explore those, those synergies with the local yeah, in the back. Um, one of the problems we have um, on campus is that when it comes to innovations and patents and stuff, a lot of times the faculty can be at odds with the administration on, on what yeah. the administration wants to do, what the faculty thinks is right. Um, when it comes to a, um, a legal input, um, the legal input always goes to the attorneys that sit right beside the patent, the administration. 
And 100% of the time, they just do whatever the administration really wants them to do. And, and, and the fact that they end up being in a very bad spot, as well as other um, employee vendors here on campus. Is there any chance that your center can become a faculty advocate on this campus and actually have a true representation? Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, so the, right, so, so, right, so Galen's thoughts here, right, is very much there's this potential of odds between faculty folk, and, and folks who are coming up with an innovation, but it turns out it's owned by the university. Um, and, right, and, right, well, right, 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 certain things are owned, right, and so, right, and so, um, right, so a natural conflict there. Uh, and, um, right, and, and we're very, right, and we're very aware of that conflict uh, and how that and how that exists, uh, and and there's even a potential conflict even when the university is on board and we have a kind of a spin-off company using university technology. Uh, sometimes, right? Sometimes the recommendations for the spin-off company uh, may be they're potentially at odds with what the university would like, uh, and so right. And, and so uh, we're. I, I guess the answer is we have not settled on how on on the exact way that we're doing that, that okay, we're handling I mean, that. I see it in my other job, I'm a mediator. I mean, I see us as a facilitator, and we can help and foster those negotiations and try to create better communication links. I do see us possibly playing a role that way. And one more, not being advocates. One more thing I might add is. Part of what I, I will be doing in the next few months is interacting at conferences with my counterparts at some of the big schools that have already done these programs. And they have the same exact you know, scenarios with faculty and with administration. And that's already been identified as one of the concerns and one of the issues. So I'm going to explore it and find out and all that kind of dialogue as to where it can go. It's obviously part of the client intake uh, process because they won't create problems if uh, you know, faculty and administration are, uh, administration are at odds. So we really need to hash it out. But there's a lot of uh, exploration and research that needs to go into it. But it's on the uh, slate for things to be examined. Uh, one more quick. Go ahead. <laughs> Two more quick questions. Uh, a quick comment. Usually, after the carrots, it's the big stick that follows. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe I made this. I mean, I I on purpose made this uh, this patent symbol here very small, right? When you get a patent, you used to get a gold a gold seal. Now you just get an email about it. Uh, but uh, but right from right, it turns out to be one patent turns out to be pretty small, uh, and, uh, and and for many companies, they find out it's not the big stick they had hoped for. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How do you reconcile well, that? Yeah, so the, so the university is a not for, right, the university is a state institution. It's a branch of the state of Missouri. Uh, but, but we're thinking of, right, but, uh, but the university makes money from its patents. Uh, and, and, right, and uh, all, right, f in, in, from my standpoint, the fact that you call something a not for profit, what that means is that you don't have investors that are making money from the university. Um, but we have a number of, right, the NFL is also a not-for-profit organization. University is, is not-for-profit in its standpoint. It certainly brings in a tremendous amount of money, and it is certainly a market <coughs> player in the market where it works, right? It's, it's mainly in the market for students, uh, and it has to figure out what's a competitive price for the product we're providing, uh, and, right? And the university does that in the marketplace. Uh, and, right, and, and so this, in many ways, is not much of a transition. Uh, and the university has been going through this transition over the past 35 years. Uh, and so, that, so, uh, so what we're doing is not really a big change from what's been happening already. Is that? Okay. Do you see any promising movement to uh, loosen the science requirement for the patent bar? Um, OK, right, so, so the question is, right, the question, uh, assume, right, there's this issue, if you want to become a, quote, patent attorney, you have to have both a background 
in science or engineering, and you also have to be a lawyer. And so there, right, uh, that's nice for patent attorneys because it very much limits the number of attorneys out there, which means we can charge higher prices. Uh, and, right, and, so, um, uh, and so the question is, is there some movement to limit that? Uh, and uh, and uh, the general answer is there are those of us, including myself, who think that it sh right, the, the technical requirement should be reduced uh, significantly from what it is. Uh, and, um, uh, but, um, but we are kind of a voice this large where, uh, where there's a voice this large on the other side saying no. And so, so the current under, right, there's, there's no proposal that's receiving any consideration to change that. The display he did and the organization it took to do this, I am totally flabbergasted. So, <laughs> 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 